Welcome to Your Need to Know. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and joining me today is Patricia Kearns, who is the Executive Director of Family Pass, based here in Fairfax County. Thank you so much for joining me, Pat. Thanks for inviting us. So Family Pass, until recently, I was not aware of your organization, but in fact, you were founded in 2006, and you are an organization that is focused on helping families that are homeless or in danger of being homeless. So give me an idea about how Family Pass got started back in 2006. Suzette Steinhardt, who lived in Vienna, was a, a family counselor, and she found that the, the system as it's set up to help families that have become homeless only really gave them about one year to get on their feet. And given some of the uh, dire circumstances these clients were in, uh, Suzette felt that this was not enough time. And so she founded her own organization to uh, nurture these families, to provide the kind of support that if you lived in a small town once upon a time, you had family, you had church, you had community to support you when you, you were down. And you know people don't have that here. Most people are, are transient. So Suzette basically put a program together where the focus was on helping people become self-sufficient to earn enough money to be able to support themselves and take them out outside of financial crisis. But her other focus was really to keep the families together because once a family becomes homeless, they go into shelters and then they um, sometimes are, the children are taken out of their normal school and put in the local school. And this is all very disrupting to children. And so Family Pass actually stands for Family Preservation and Strengthening Services. Ah. So she wanted to keep families together. And that's wonderful. I, you know, I think in Fairfax County, it's an, it's an enormously wealthy county. It's an enormous county. It's 1.2 million people. And so people are always, some people are still surprised to hear that we have a homelessness issue here in the county. And we do have an office to prevent and end homelessness. There is a that's tenure right. plan. And I know that you work closely with them as yes, well. Yes, we do to try to identify both who's at risk and who is in need of these services. So the 10-year plan started in 2008, mm -hmm. it's now 2018. Give us kind of an update on county-wise where we are with that. Well, we have good news and we have bad news. <laughs> the good news is we have about half of the homeless people that uh, we had when we started in 2008. Uh, the bad news is it's the end of the 10-year plan and we still have 987 uh, families or individuals, I'm sorry, right. uh, who are homeless. Um, but that number actually pales in comparison to the well over 20,000 households in Fairfax County alone that are at extreme risk of losing their homes. This means they're living be below the poverty line. I think there are 63,000 people in the county um, living at or below the poverty line. And um, if the economy takes a downturn, um, those 987 is, number is going to shoot way up. Well, you know, and, and they've said repeatedly that people are generally one paycheck away right. from disaster because most people don't have savings. Uh, we were talking before the show started about if your car breaks down, if you are have an illness and you can't work, if your child is ill and you can't work. Right. A lot of these, these part-time jobs are minimum wage, they're not a living wage, and they don't have benefits. So it, you know, people get sick, their kids get sick, their car breaks down. And this kind of starts this chain of events that snowballs. That's right. You know, people uh, ask, you know, is really, do we have homeless people in Fairfax County? Well, the point in time count, which is the annual count of homeless people on the street one night in January is conducted in the county and is conducted across the United States, county by county, and it's uh, mandated by the federal government. Uh, but that doesn't count the number of people who are sleeping on the floor of some friend's house temporarily. Couch surfing. That's right. And um, it, it, it just doesn't convey the, the depth of the problem. And uh, getting back to your point, the average household income in this county is about $115,000. Um, the average cost of a house is well over 500000 and the cost of renting an apartment for a family of four is about 1850 
But most of the people we deal with who are, have come to the county for emergency services, especially for rent, are working at uh, anywhere between minimum wage of $7.25 and maybe $10, $11 an hour. If they're lucky, they have a 40-hour week. Most of them don't. Right. So even if they had a 40-hour week working at $7.25 an hour, they're going to make $13,000 a year. If they have a spouse or a partner uh, who's doing the same, that's $26,000 a year. If you have an average apartment that costs $18.50, that's $22,000 a year. So how are you going to support a family of four? Right. They're paying way more for housing than they can afford to pay. Yeah, and this is, this is a problem in Fairfax um, that is magnified because of the huge disparity between incomes and in different classes of people and also because of the high cost of living in this area. Affordable housing ten, it continues to be a problem and it's not just for, for people in these low wage, and a lot no. of them are low wage service jobs. Young people getting out of school can't afford to pay their school loans back based on the job they get out of college because the housing is so. That's why so many people end up either in shared living situations with uh, unrelated adults or they move back home. And so in Fairfax County, affordable housing impacts everybody along this path. We Generally, many people in the county are paying more than 30% of their income on 50%. housing. 50%. I yeah, think it's, 50. it's closer to 50. And there's, a, there's a, uh, a caveat here. The definition of affordable housing for people who are in professions like teachers or IT specialists right. or something. The county has uh, a housing uh, agency and they do have affordable housing units and they have what they call work force housing units and these are designated for people such as teachers and um, fire p firemen so that they can live in the county. Um, the affordable housing for our clients does not exist. It doesn't, I know it doesn't. Uh, there is some public housing but very little. There's some subsidized housing that comes with federal restrictions and um, again it si simply doesn't cover the number of people who are in need. So you are doing this one family at a time, I know that. I yeah. think since your founding you've served over 120 families and that includes over 250 children because I think the other thing is people don't realize of the homeless population in Fairfax County, I think like 33% are under the age of 18. That's right. Um, the real significance in keeping people in their homes rather than waiting till they become homeless is that the impact on homelessness on children is devastating. It affects their behavior. They get behavioral issues, psychological issues. They have um, long-term chronic illnesses are related to periods being, of homelessness, being insecure, yeah. not having food insecurity and housing insecurity. Um, and also a lot of our, our clients are domestic abuse survivors. And it's been uh, studied and proven that Children even under the age of one who witness domestic violence are impacted psychologically by it. So it's very important for us to keep these children in their homes and um, we work with them and try to get them as much uh, educational enhancement as possible and to keep their homes as secure as possible. Right, safety is important. I think about Maslow's hierarchy of need, you know, and that, that uh, basic food and housing at the bottom and then safety and then you know this feeling of being in a community where you're loving it you know we have to start at the bottom or nobody ever gets to the top that's right and so I do think you know when you talk about safety that's something we don't always talk about in trying to help these families who are living on the edge that they don't feel safe that the security is more than just financial or food insecurity well, you know getting back to the subsidized housing and this relates to what you're saying um, there's something called um, rapid rehousing and basically it gives a client a house a client in need a house for one year but over the period of that year that client must assume a greater and greater responsibility for paying for that uh, to the point where at the end of the year or sometimes two years um, they they have to pay hundred percent or they lose that housing right. Uh, this is not always possible, and, and I, I did hear one woman interviewed on the Koji Nam, Nambi show one, one morning um, say, they give you housing, but they don't tell you they're going to take it away from you. 
And a lot of times the skill services needed are not provided. And certainly for someone who's recovering from having just fled a domestic abuse situation, has left everything behind, has, has grabbed her children and, and, and run, and has never had a job or has a language problem or has no skill sets, um, a year is not enough time for them to catch up. So then, yes, they do lose their housing. So you take a comprehensive approach. So you are looking at how, a housing first model. That's right. Because you, ha and that they have proven across the country, I think Salt Lake City, Utah is one where they have this rapid rehousing program and they have proved the efficacy of providing that housing first. Then it's medical care, it's counseling, it's job skills training, it's helping somebody to find a job, it's helping them to learn to budget, it's helping them to learn how to manage all the things that go with keeping the house. That's right. So you are also providing these some of these comprehensive services as well. Yes, we do. We focus on um, first making sure that the housing is secure. Then we try and work with them so they can set goals to find a path towards financial self-sufficiency, which may include a job training program or education. We put a lot of our money into education. We provide transportation assistance because you have to have a car in this county or you can't get. A lot of our clients have two and three jobs. They've got to get between jobs. They have to pick up their children. Um, we help with medical care, especially dental, because that's not usually it's not covered by not anything. covered. Uh, child care if it's not covered. Um, and we, we measure their progress on what we call a self-sufficiency matrix. So all of those things that you listed, mm -hmm. including parenting skills, budgeting skills, um, education, uh, I increased earnings, that's all measured on a, on a monthly basis for each client. So we can, we can see where the need is for them to work a little bit more towards their goals. And, and to that end, you, so you have a very small staff, it's yes. five people, but that does include case managers because this is where, you know, having somebody who's actually managing these different services and the specific needs and tailoring a program to a specific client is really where this becomes successful as opposed to other kinds of programs where you're putting somebody here and hoping that they find the skills or the job or the training or the, or the services right. that they need. So when we return from our break, we are going to talk further with Pat Kearns about how Family Pass is meeting the needs of some of our challenged residents here in Fairfax County. Why is Connor having trouble focusing in school? Having trouble finding Connor's middle school? Would you like directions? No, why is Connor having trouble focusing in school? Finding lowest airfare to Istanbul. No, I'm, I'm tired of fighting with him over homework. Home walk restaurant. Need a review? No, I need help. He's very smart, but his mind it wanders. He's disorganized. I think I understand. Oh, God. French fries. Finding best potatoes. No! Russet. Fingerling. You can't go. <sighs> Why don't you understand me? Sorry, I was trying to show how Connor feels every day. Frustrating, isn't it? Redirecting to understood.org. For the one in five kids with learning and attention issues, this is what life can feel like. Explore understood.org, a free online resource about learning and attention issues designed to help your child thrive in school and in life. Understood.org, because understanding is everything. <laughs> Maria, so how's work? It was fourth period biology. Our students just weren't getting how easily viruses spread. So Ms. Bell and I had them role play a zombie virus outbreak. By the time they had all learned the lesson, all the living were dead. Hey, how's your job going? That big sales meeting I planned? Next year, I might get to go. <clears throat> cool. Welcome back to Your Need to Know. I'm your host, Katherine Reed. Today we are talking with Pat Kearns, who is the Executive Director of Family Pass here in Fairfax County. I so appreciate you being here, Pat. This is fascinating information about an organization I didn't know that much about. Well, again, thank you for having us. And um... Let's talk a little bit about 
um, how you interact with other nonprofits and with the county. I said, you know, people who watch the show know I sit on the board of Bright Paths, and that is a nonprofit also based here in the county that does similar things. And so no one nonprofit can do everything alone, especially when you've got a staff of five people. So tell us a little That's bit right. about your partnerships and in collaborations. Fact, in fact, we, we send many of our clients to Bright Paths, so uh, <laughs> we appreciate what you do. Uh, not a lot of people understand how the system works in Fairfax County. Uh, there is a county office called the Coordinated Services Planning, and they get people who uh, have emergency needs, uh, and they're referred to the, the county uh, system. And they interview them, find out what their needs are, and then they farm them out to the appropriate group. So if they only need food, maybe they'll come to you. Mm -hmm. If they need uh, housing, uh, the immediate shelter, and they're homeless, they may go to the shelter house or Cornerstones or home stretch. Um, if they need to have uh, emergency ser financial services to prevent homelessness, they'll send them to us because that's what we do. And then once we help them, we, um, we provide the other services. We also get referrals from uh, Northern Virginia Family Thanks Services. Service. They have uh, families that are in what's called the Bridging Affordability Program, which is two years of subsidized housing. Again, at, there is a requirement that at the end of two years, they have full responsibility for their rent. Um, and Northern Virginia, Family Services doesn't have the kind of intensive case management program that we do, so they refer their clients to us. Once they're in the housing, we start working on them so that they will be prepared by the end of two years to fully meet their obligations. Um, we coordinate and collaborate all the time. We're a member of the um, Fairfax Falls Church um, Collaboration to Prevent and End Homelessness. We, um, and there's a housing network too, isn't there? There is a Falls housing, Church. yes, there is a housing network. Uh, Sue Hahn, who's our uh, case supervisor, is very involved with that. Um, but it, it's difficult finding housing for these families right? because uh, they have bad credit scores. And if you have a bad credit score, the company that manages the apartment building is saying no. Even before we were talking about affordable housing, um, there is a, a ruling that 20% of new housing is supposed to be set aside for affordable housing. Now, um, the definition of affordable housing is, quite frankly, um, people who make 100% of the, of the uh, cutoff amount, and that can be seventy, eighty, ninety thousand dollars 90000 Right. So that by the time you get those families in, the people who are at the very low income level are not going to, to get into any kind of housing at all. So we have to work pr with private landlords and convince them that this client is worth taking a chance on. You know, and that is tough too. I work with organizations who support formerly incarcerated men and women, and having that felony on your record is the same thing. It's kind of like, how do you find housing for people when the landlord has the um, you know, he, he can basically say, because you're a felon, we're not going to accept your application. That's right. So you're left with this population of people that it's very difficult to find housing for. And yet, as we discussed in the first segment, it's got to be a housing first. You can't really work on all these other things if there's not stable housing. And what people don't realize is these families that are low-income families are part of the fabric of our economy. They are the people who are manning our daycare centers our elder care centers. Um, they're doing service work. They're doing service work. And you know, it used to be they could live just over the county line in something affordable. But now you have to go all the way to West Virginia. That's true. Uh, to be able to f afford something. And it, it's, it's a really good question. How are we going to live as an economy if we have no room for this segment? I know the county really touts the uh, focus on diversity. Mm -hmm but I don't see that it's happening. Yeah. And I don't see that there's a lot in the um, future plans of this county for more um, subsidized or public housing. It's just not enough to meet the need. It's not, and transportation continues to be a problem too. Centerville's a good example of where people move out there because the housing tends to be a little bit lower than some of the other areas of the county, but it's because it's a transportation desert. 
If you don't have a car, That's you right. can't get out of Centerville. Right. There's no rail, there's no bus, there's no way you're stuck there without a car. And it's expensive to own and maintain a car in in this country, in this county. So, you know, there's just so many situations where you solve one problem, but then you've got another problem. So transportation, affordable housing factor in, and then you've got someone has to take these low skilled service jobs. I mean, the people who wait on us in restaurants, the people in the kitchen, the people who clean the office buildings while we're at home, but you know, somebody, they have to have a place to live because those jobs have to be done. And, and, and what happens is they do, as you referred to before, live in multiple, um, you know, multiple families live together. Right, and as the only way they can afford, afford it. And that creates an image uh, from others in the surrounding community that these, and these people are hanging around outside and they're, you know, they're having right. a drink outside and I don't want them in my neighborhood. Nobody wants affordable housing in their neighborhood. But the fact is, this is the only privacy they get. Right. To go outside. To, <laughs> yeah, to, right. Because they're living on top of each other. They're literally. living on top of each other. And um, there's, there's no solution to that because as long as people have property values and they don't want to see their property values go down, they're not going to allow affordable housing in their community. Yeah, and it needs to be distributed. And I know that Sharon Bolova has spoken about that numerous times, that we, we don't want housing projects. That's not what we want, is these tall housing projects that affordable units should be, and that's why they are, they're talking about these set-asides for yeah. new construction. You shouldn't know what anybody makes in your neighborhood, right. right? Everybody should live in a decent neighborhood in, in a safe neighborhood and you should know what anybody earns because there should be a range of housing and a range of housing costs for people to live together. Unfortunately, I think the only public housing on the building blocks right now is down in the Route 1 corridor. I know. And to me, that is creating a, a mini ghetto. It's, yeah. it's, it's a project. And um, I don't know how, what you can do to change people's minds about having a diversity in your neighborhood. Um, well, I think they tried to do that with the Section 8 vouchers. You know, when well, they, and I don't know how well that system is working. I it seems to me it's shrinking. Of, that's bridging affordability now. Yeah, bridging affordability. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, You've got to get private landlords to accept, accept the vouchers. Th there's a long waiting line for that, yeah. and um, there aren't enough units. Um, but again, I think the whole point is you've got to sort of challenge people's stereotypes about who the homeless are. Right. It's not the, um, the substance abuser standing on the street corner. Um, they represent a percentage, but the homeless break down into the abusers, uh, but also the disabled. Right. Uh, but 50% of them are families. Yeah. And 50% of all homeless on that one night count of 987 are children. Yeah. And so. And they've done nothing. Like, and, they've and, done nothing to be, and the other to point, deserve to be homeless. Right. And the other point is that most of these families are working. They're, they're yes. the working poor. Okay. That is a, I'm glad you brought that up because that's the other thing is people think that homeless people are living under a bridge. You're looking and, for a free hand. Right, and that's not it at all. Most, no. of, most of them are fully employed. They just can't afford a house. I have a client uh, who is a domestic violence uh, survivor. She doesn't read or write. She has two jobs, three children, including an infant. She's learning how to read and write. And she said, you know, I came to this country because I wanted something better for my children. When you when you can't read, it's like ble being blind. Yeah. But here she is working two jobs, struggling, and taking courses at night so she can learn how to read. And these, these are hardworking people. So I really wish the stereotype would kind of you know, and I think lose we, it. And, and I'm glad that, you know, one of the things I love about having this show is exactly that, is having people on to dispel what we think about as far as the people who live in this county and the the people that are served by nonprofits like yours and like Bright Paths, who they are, because we just have this idea in our head. Because, and the funny thing is, we meet them every day. We just don't know, you right? You don't know. That's you don't right. know. They're at the library. They're standing behind you in the grocery store line. You know, they're they're at the Starbucks. They're they're waiting on you somewhere, and you don't know their story. And they seem like perfectly nice people to you. And if you did know that they were living in your their car, you would be like, "This is incredible! Like, what can I do to help?" And that's the other thing I want to talk about is how can people help? If people are like, I want to be part 
of helping these people to be self-sufficient. What can I do? You know, what are the opportunities with Family Pass? Of course, you can always give to any of these organizations, Absolutely. including ours. Um, volunteer work, some are more volunteer focused. Ours is not so much because we like to maintain our clients' um, privacy. And that's very hard to do. We do have some volunteers who help tutor them. But you can also get involved in your community. Uh, raise funds in your community. Um, of course, collect food and clothing. Um, don't do it just once a year during right. Thanksgiving or Christmas because that always because happens. the I know we get inundated with all of these wonderful generous people. And, but yeah. the rest of the year they also eat. Yeah, <laughs> and need clothes and, and need clothes. Yeah. That's right. Um, and so you can do that. Uh, you can also get involved in civic organizations so that when the county comes to find out what the grassroots thinks about building affordable housing in your neighborhood, that you take another look at it and speak up and challenge the, um, the resistance in communities of not having. I think you make a good point about civic engagement. A lot of people don't go to the town the town council meetings or the city council meetings, they don't go to the board of supervisors right. hearings or they don't go to town hall meetings when there are town hall meetings to understand how their neighbors feel and to be the voice that says, you know, I think there's a place for a lots of different kinds of people in our community and in our neighborhoods and how can we work together to figure out how to make it work. I mean, it's a democracy, you know, it, it's people powered and I think sometimes people don't think their lone voice or showing up makes a difference and in fact, it's the only thing that makes a difference. And, and, and Fairfax County, especially the Housing Authority, makes a big deal out of listening to these, these grassroots community groups. So I say speak up. Yeah, and I agree with you that people need to show up, speak up, and be informed about organizations like yours helping the people that we run into every single day where we don't know their story. Right. So I want to thank you very much, Pat, for being here. This well, has thanks been, for giving us a chance to talk about ourselves. It's been very educational. And for those of you who are also learning about Family Pass for the first time, this is what you need to know.